So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Brene Lloyd and I'm with Northwatch and uh, I am part of the Nuclear Waste Watch Radioactive Waste uh, Policy Review Campaign Steering Committee. And this is the third webinar in our series. And uh, we're very uh, pleased to welcome author Paul McKay uh, to talk about uh, his book, the updated edition of Atomic Accomplice. And we also have chapter author Susan O'Donnell and uh, Angela Bischoff from Ontario Clean Air Alliance to talk about one of the SMRs being promoted in Canada right now. So I'm joining you from the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory from the overlapping territory of Nipissing First Nation and Kibbewick, uh, Algonquin unceded territories. And I welcome everyone to put their land acknowledgements and uh, any other greetings in the chat function. And I'm going to now uh, hand it over to um, Paul McKay, uh, who is our first speaker tonight. So let me just stop the share. And uh, Paul, over to you. Okay, you're going to have to instruct me. Do I have to press share screen or the little blue button? <laughs> um, the small green button with an arrow, the share screen. So uh, use share screen and then you'll have a choice of screens to choose and choose your PowerPoint presentation. Okay, has it appeared? It has appeared. So now if you would just choose the slideshow function, go to the upper left in your uh, screen. There yep. you go. Um, okay, thanks upper, very much. Upper left, Paul, and it'll and choose from the beginning and it'll switch to your slide. There you go. Okay, great. Perfect. Thanks very much. And Thank uh, you. welcome to everyone. And thanks to uh, the co-author, Susan O'Donnell. Uh, Gordon Edwards is uh, signed up here. We'll see him hopefully at some point. Um, and Ole Hendrickson, I see, has signed in as well. And then we have Angela Bischoff from the uh, Bischoff from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. So I have 20 minutes um, to give a synopsis of the new edition of um, Acom Atomic Accomplice. Um, I'm going to take the first six or seven minutes to talk about something very grim which is the role of plutonium and nuclear proliferation and Canada's role in that, which is covered in the book. And then the last uh, third, two thirds of the, my presentation is gonna be on very positive stuff. So hang in there and, and uh, don't shoot the messenger before you uh, hear the good stuff. Um, so I'll start. Um, 80 years ago in 1943, Canada joined the World War II Manhattan Project. Uh, which began to secretly design, build, and test the first atomic weapons in human history. In August 1945, a uranium-235 bomb and a plutonium bomb were dropped on two Japanese cities. Each de detonated in a microsecond and ushered in an age of perpetual peril. So this is the city of Hir Hiroshima before a single atomic bomb is dropped. Um, it contained uh, 64 kilograms of uranium-235. Days later, this is the scene, completely vaporized, the uh, epicenter of the bomb explosion. I'm not going to show uh, details of human misery and destruction uh, because we all pretty much know what happened. But I want to demonstrate the scale and scope of this horrific new weapon um, that was uh, ushered in 1945. So the Hiroshima bomb, as I mentioned, had uranium-235, um, but it was crewed by modern standards because only 600 grams of uranium-235, which is about the weight of a butterfly, fully fission. So of the 64 kilograms, only 600 grams actually caused all the destruction that you just saw. This is the city of Nagasaki before the a plutonium bomb was dropped three days later. And this is what it looked like after. <clears throat> so the plutonium bomb only had 6.4 kilograms of plutonium, of, 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 of which about 900 grams fully fission. 
900 grams is about, whoops, too far here, the weight of a Luna Moth caterpillar. And it exploded with a force of 20,000 tons of TNT. At both A bombs uh, killed as many as 200,000 people. Plus, there were horrific burns, uh, people living with nightmares for the rest of their lives. <clears throat> so, today, the most sophisticated nuclear weapons are far more powerful than the ones that were dropped on Japan. This is the nose cone of an intercontinental ballistic missile. And each, each missile can carry between 10, up to 10 or 15 even uh, warheads, which these black cones represent. And they're almost always plutonium because plutonium is lighter. Um, so the missile can go farther. And these individual warheads can be in, independently targeted. So programmed to hit different targets on the descent of the missile. Um, so for our subject today, I wanna to emphasize that most of the plutonium that's now being created in the world is being created by civilian re reactors like the Darlington reactors in Ontario. There's 410 nuclear power plants in the world and they produce 70 tons of plutonium annually. Yet they meet only 4% of world energy demand or about 10% of electricity demand. So plutonium also has other diabolical characteristics. Most notably, it has a half-life of 24,000 years, uh, which means that after that period of time, the plutonium still has half of its mass and half of its latent lethality. Um, so if you look 24,000 years backward in human history, these cave paintings were made 24,000 years ago. So that's how long into the future uh, it will take plutonium to lose only half of its mass and potential lethality as a weapon. So Canada, as I mentioned at the beginning, became uh, involved in the uh, Manhattan Project. And although this NRX research reactor at Chalk River wasn't built uh, by the time the war ended, it was built soon after um, construction started in 1947. Um, and uh, the public was never told, but this reactor that was inside here was a unique uh, type of reactor because it used natural uranium and uh, um, heavy water as uh, to moderate uh, the, the neutron activity inside the reactor and also to cool the reactor. So the Americans didn't have a reactor like this, although they paid for this reactor and they had a secret agreement to take all of the plutonium that this reactor created for 20 years. Um, uh, the United States didn't have any of this type of reactor, which is a very um, prolific producer of plutonium um, until they cloned uh, this reactor and built four in South Carolina during the, during the Cold War. So the, as I mentioned, the, the public was not told about any of this, um, and, but there was heavy uh, gar guards at the peaceful civilian research site up in Chalk River. And the reason was because, whoops, uh, Canada sent the plutonium that was created in the reactor. It was in hot fuel bundles and they sent the hot fuel bundles down to South Carolina where the US Defense Department would, would extracted uh, them and used the plutonium for the uh, hydrogen bomb program. Um, this is the only picture I've ever been able to find of the interior of a, a plutonium reprocessing plant. This is called a canyon. And you can see how far it goes into the distance. And what happens is the hot fuel bundles are um, opened in um, remote locations so that the radiation can't kill the, the technicians. They're cut up with shears and then dropped into these huge vats where nitric acid and another uh, solvent are used to uh, cook the whole radioactive uh, um, 
particles or pieces in inside the fuel bundles and separate out the plutonium and the uh, highly enriched uranium, residual highly enriched uranium. So the reason I wanted to show this is because 250 kilograms of plutonium was sent from Chalk River to this place in South Carolina strictly for military purposes to build hydrogen bombs. So 250 kil kilograms, and re remember it's 900 grams that fission in the plutonium bomb at Nagasaki. 6.4 kilograms were actually in that in that bomb. So that gives you an idea of why the Americans were interested in uh, paying for the Chalk River uh, NRX reactor because they got the, the plutonium from it. So finally, as I mentioned, I didn't want to show horrific scenes of human tragedy at Hiroshima or Nagasaki, but this is one of the victims. Her name was uh, Sadako Sasaki, and uh, she was born in 1943. So she was two when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. And um, by all accounts, she put up a brave battle. Um, this is the hospital where she was at the end. And her last uh, mission was inspired by an ancient Japanese legend uh, that said, if you can make a thousand peace cranes, then um, you can uh, uh, bring happiness. And uh, so she actually did that. Um, and uh, some of her school classmates uh, helped uh, with those peace cranes as well. Okay, so onto the, onto the good green stuff. So um, Ontario actually was the world leader, the world leader in renewable power um, a century ago when um, the Ontario government uh, created a public utility and borrowed the money to build the Adam Beck uh, generating station at Niagara Falls. So this is a remarkable uh, achievement uh, because it's still operating flawlessly a hundred years later, flawlessly. Um, and it's a very simple, rugged, but elegant design. So Lake Erie is above the falls, kind of around the corner here. And they built a concrete wall underneath the water as it was flowing to go over the falls on an angle and diverted the water into this canal up here. And the water fell down these penstocks and then turbines were in these buildings here and the water turned the turbines and you can see the outflow from the, from the power plants here. So that's a hundred years of green power from this one site with no dam built. So it doesn't get any better than that. And there's been some, some upgrades one ingenious one. So the Canadian government has an, uh, an agreement with the uh, American federal government to divide the amount of water going over the falls. There's an American falls and on the Canadian side, there's the Horseshoe Falls. So they, they both agreed, this was in 1906 under the Boundary, water, Boundary Waters Act to uh, let a, a, a certain amount of water flow over the falls during the daytime for tourism. And then at night, they can actually take more because the tourists, most tourists aren't looking at the falls at that time. So that's pretty ingenious, but they also figured a way to put reversible pumps in one of these generating stations and the water that fl uh, flowed over the falls comes down here and then it, they have reverse turbines and they can pump the water up into a reservoir that goes, you can't see it, up there. And then they let it fall back down the turbines when there's peak demand. So this whole thing um, op can operate as a giant battery. So this um, started putting in power into the grid in 1921. So it's just over a hundred years old. And with the recent upgrades, um, it probably will last another hundred years. And it was called uh, white coal. Hydropower was called white coal at the time because uh, Ontario depended almost completely on coal imported from Pennsylvania before this uh, power plant was built. And the coal industry was run by these three uh, uh, moguls who were widely reviled by everybody because they had bad service, high rates, and the coal plants were filthy. Um, so that put us on the map in terms of renewable power. Whoops. Um, so now I have some uh, trick question, 
quick questions here for you. Which of the following images do not, does not fit the pattern? I'll go through them pretty quickly. If you look really carefully, you see that these women are packing the Rubber Soul album of the Beatles. So that's about 1965. That's a, a flat TV screen um, manufacturing plant. This is making iPhones. And this is making solar panels. So the answer is, of course, all of the above. And the secret to all the su success of all of these consumer products, basically, from ketchup to vinyl records to uh, iPhones to the solar panel is that they can be replicated at scale. Um, whoops. I'm sorry, I'm gotten. Right, I better go to my text here. So, once the uh, hydro plant was built at Niagara, it took 150 years for Canada to um, build all of the generating capacity that exists now. Some was retired of, because of age, et cetera. But the total peak uh, output of all the generation in Canada right now is about 150,000 megawatts. So compare that to last year, the top six solar panel manufacturing plants in the world um, generated 300,000 megawatts panels that could produce 300,000 megawatts in one year. So that's why I'm, the theme of my talk is that it's actually this ability to replicate the same unit whether it's an iPhone or a vinyl record or Heinz ketchup um, or Model T's from the Henry Ford plant, the thing that makes it um, extremely successful is that you can replicate, this, replicate the same thing again and again. And when you do that, the larger the scale there is, the more the cost goes down, the more there's consumer uptake and the more plants people make to make that product, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a this is the secret sauce that renewables have, including um, including uh, wind turbines, uh, um, storage batteries, and particularly so solar panels. Like you can see on the screen here, the plant in Ontario, that's uh, Canadian Solar, they punch out a new panel like this every forty seconds, twenty four seven. So that explains how. Um, the, the volume of new uh, generating capacity can be 300,000 just in the top solar six solar companies worldwide. Um, there's more that are in lower tiers. But the same thing can happen with and is happening with wind turbines. So the, the great news in terms of uh, the campaign to end uh, nuclear power as a, as a substitute or a a way to decarbonize um, is that nuclear power and natural gas plants and certainly coal plants, et cetera, they cannot compete whatsoever with um, these technologies that can be replicated all over the world and, and record time and, and be um, constructed in record time. So typically from the time an order is placed, um, a solar, pan solar panels can be made at a speed of 40 seconds per per unit and they can be uh, installed and be hooked up and delivering power to the grid within about two years. That's, that's a typical um, uh, construction time. So compare that to a nuclear power plant when it takes at least 12 to 15 years to get uh, a project up and running in, in recent history in the United States and, and, and in Europe um, with huge co cost overruns, et cetera. Um, and, and then, the problem, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that um, each reactor, no matter where it's made or what, what model it is, produces plutonium. So combined, the, 
the um, the fleet in the world right now produces about 70 tons of plutonium uh, per year. Um, if countries tried to double the number of nuclear power plants in the world to combat climate change, they would be making 140 tons of uh, plutonium per year. And we don't need another gram of plutonium in, in the human future. Um, so that cla claims from the nuclear industry that nuclear power is a safe, clean, cheap, and timely uh, remedy for climate change is, is ludicrous. And it's, it can't be substantiated by reality or any uh, evidence. So um, all of these uh, technologies can be mass produced and they can be put on the same site. Like this is a real, this is a real site. Um, um, they're called the trifecta sites. And with the recent um, Biden administration budget support for renewables, and to a lesser extent, the budget that was announced yesterday in Canada, but also in places like Europe are trying to match the United States and Australia. Investment money is already pouring big time into these types of these types of projects. So, and the advent of more panels and more demand for panels is actually creating um, elegant options that were never thought of before. So this is a solar farm on a lagoon. The fish can still feed under it. There's light uh, that goes, goes around and through. They can swim away from it, et cetera. Another option is a solar farm behind a hydro dam on the reservoir that's created by the dam. Um, this is um, agrovoltaics, photovoltaics and agriculture. So um, this maximizes land use uh, for producing uh, food, uh, but also generates power uh, for lighting, et cetera, in the greenhouse, but shade as well, which is very important. And the surplus power can be put into the grid. Um, cows create manure that has methane. So these are, uh, meth this is a methane digester, which takes the manure and traps the methane gas and puts it through a turbine and creates electricity to send into the grid. Uh, this is, <laughs> This is a solar farm and a sheep farm. The sheep love the shade, they love the grass. The solar uh, farm owner loves the fact that the grass is being mowed by sheep, not, um, and they don't have to pay people to go around with uh, huge mowing machines. Um, this, sorry, this is not a very good sharp picture, but um, pollinators love uh, solar parks. Um, this is an interesting, uh, solar farm. It's actually solar panels going way off into the distance on an irrigation canal. So they, it provides power to pump uh, water into the uh, adjacent fields. But equally important, the solar panels reduce the evaporation on the, on the irrigation canal. And water, this is in India, so water is extremely precious. Um, also in India, there's 8 million diesel pumps right now that um, uh, rural farmers like this uh, use to pump water uh, to their fields. Uh, they're expensive, they're dirty, um, and they're hard to move, et cetera. So a solar panel with a, a DC pump is, uh, is the best answer. So 8 million of these units could be put in, um, in India or the Philippines or Pakistan or Brazil or wherever. Uh, this is a um, wind and solar farm in Senegal in Africa. So an important point in terms of um, a, a just transition is that this kind of technology can be used to um, alleviate poverty in third world countries. Um, it, it, it so happens that the best places on the planet for solar generation, the most irradiation uh, per square meter is in is where most of the world's poor people live. So these kinds of projects can actually uh, help develop rural grids um, in in some of the poorest areas in the world. This is a plant in China that's mass producing wind turbines. These are 
for uh, ocean um, wind farms, offshore ocean wind farms. And the, the turbines are absolutely massive. They can, uh, one turbine can uh, provide enough power for 138,000 homes. The turbines can also be placed uh, offshore like this and the electricity that's generated by the wind farm can be used to make hydrogen, green, completely pure green hydrogen. This is an electrolyzer. So the, the current goes through this uh, electrolyzer, and electric current splits the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms and they, they can be sent in separate streams. So the hydrogen can be uh, located near a, uh, a cargo ship dock so that instead of using dirty bunker sea fuel to ply the oceans, um, it can the engine engine can be converted to hydrogen uh, with no emissions, or uh, the hydrogen can be a um, pipeline to shore for industrial uses. And it's happening in Rotterdam, for instance, in in the Netherlands now. Um, and the oxygen can actually be uh, separated and used and, and used as a medical gas or for some specialized industrial purposes. Again, de decarbonizing uh, down the ray. So this is a, a combined uh, wind and solar and uh, battery storage project in Australia. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, more on the way because of favorable tax uh, uh, upgrades or uh, improvements in recent legislation in the United States and Europe. Um, we'll see in Canada, uh, but Australia as well. This is the largest train station in China um, and it's uh, a vast solar array on top. Uh, buildings can be uh, have solar integrated right into the building, either when it's built, which is best, or it can be backfitted onto existing buildings. And you can see they have the, the panel efficiency has doubled, almost doubled in the last 10 years through different uh, and better chemistries, et cetera. Um, and uh, they they've also can also make them flexible now. So they can put, be put on buildings, even with curves like this. Sorry for the uh, fuzzy uh, picture here. So existing solar farms or existing wind farms or exist an existing solar farm and wind farm can easily be backfitted with um, uh, battery storage that can come in a large shipping container like we saw earlier. Now the batteries are inside the shipping containers but the batteries themselves are the same batteries they're just packed differently that are that drive a Tesla, for instance, or a Chevrolet Bolt, um, or are used in uh, uh, digital cameras. Like it's the same kind of battery cell that's about this long with, with lithium inside. An interesting uh, aspect of the lithium equation is that although there's certainly environmental uh, impacts with lithium mining, if the lithium is put into a car battery like a Tesla, the, the, the battery de, um, degrades over time with use like any battery does. Uh, but when the batteries are taken out of a Tesla or a Chev Chevrolet Volt or any uh, electric vehicle, they still have 80% of the power left in the lithium. So those batteries, those car batteries, and it's happening now, can be uh, linked up in series and put on a site like this to be the backup uh, to, to um, ensure proper grid voltage. When the wind doesn't blow, but the solar is shining, they can even that out. When the, when the wind is blowing and the solar, the sun's gone down, they can even that out. And now with new legislation, um, the, the developers are getting paid for the services that they provide, which traditionally they haven't. The utility just took the benefits and didn't pay anything for it. But now uh, legislation is forcing the utilities, like in California, for instance, to pay for the, for the value of what these uh, projects. Uh, and for the first time, like in, in the Biden administration legislation, there's specific language that ensures that these trifecta sites get the best uh, tax credit um, uh, values or offsets. Uh, which make them more attractive financially. And that's why uh, like billions and billions and billions are now flowing into these kinds of projects. Okay, there's Greta way down in the, 
in the front there, uh, my heroine. Um, so the, the last thought I wanted to leave you with is climate change is prevent, presenting an awful perspective for us and our children and our grandchildren. And it's tempting to, I think, psychologically not want to have another um, existential threat to think about or on your other shoulder or think about it's in your future or your children's future. But the plutonium issue is one we can't ignore. And it comes with every reactor, no matter what the industry says, it comes with every reactor and it's got a half-life of 24,000 years. So think about what's happened in the last hundred years in Russia, for instance, there was or a little more than a hundred years. There was a, a czar, then there was a fledgling democracy uh, under Kerensky that lasted less than a year. Then there was the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, then Lenin died. Then we had Stalin. Um, and now we've got Putin. So just in the space of over 120 years, we've had these violent oscillations in, in how the Soviet Union or Russia operates. And they have the most nuclear weapons in the world. And just this week, Vladimir Putin has said he's going to put tactical nuclear weapons that almost certainly contain uh, our, our plutonium bombs, move them into Belarus and point them to uh, Europe. Um, he's the one who illegally, brutally invaded the Ukraine, and uh, he's as dangerous a, a human being as, as imaginable. So when we think about nuclear power, uh, we need to keep our eye on the ball that plutonium comes with it and it's a and it's a built-in li liability and uh, for that reason alone there's other reasons like nuclear safety what to do with uh, regular nuclear waste the radiological um, harm uh, and dangers that come with plutonium and other uh, radionuclides which Gordon can speak to um, all these issues um, are there, but the one in the background that the nuclear industry never wants to talk about is the issue of the plutonium um, and the link to proliferation. So I hope the last part of the presentation has inspired you a little bit and and uh, made you feel a little bit more upbeat about um, the the battles that we have to continue continue fighting. But um, hope is on the horizon. Um, it's basically already here. Uh, we don't hear about it so much because the media tends to cover just uh, maybe a renewable project in their coverage area, but we don't get a satellite view of what's happening on the globe. And it's great stuff. Like it's, it's, there's nothing speculative about it. When, when six panel makers are making 300,000 uh, megawatts worth of panels every year, and they're going to make more this year than they're 300,000 the year after, because they're already booked five years into the future, because it's the cheapest, cleanest, safest, fastest way to uh, produce elect new electricity. Anyway, I'll leave it with that. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much, Paul. That was, uh, took us on a roller coaster from the lows of nuclear power to the highs of uh, a, a renewable alternative, and then a little bit of a dip back into the low again. Thanks very much. And uh, that was really, really excellent. Very helpful. I'm going to turn it over now to Susan O'Donnell. Uh, so uh, Paul is the author of Atomic Accomplice. And in the 2023 edition, there were six guest authors uh, wrote additional and new chapters. And Susan O'Donnell is uh, one of those chapter authors. And uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Susan. Susan. And I think Susan is not going to use slides, so I'm going to change the view if I can. Um, go ahead, Susan. Great. Thanks a lot, Bernane. So I live in Fredericton. Um, I'm an adjunct professor at the University of New Brunswick and St. Thomas University, and I'm also one of the spokespersons uh, in the Coalition for Responsible Energy Development in New Brunswick. And as Bernane said, I'm one of the new um, chapter co-authors that the piece that Paul just talked about, about the green energy um, is one of the new chapters as well. And I co-wrote this chapter, which Paul titled, he gave it the interesting title, 
Whistling Past the Nuclear Graveyard. I co-wrote it with Ole Hendrickson of Concerned Citizens of Renfrew County and Area and Janice Harvey at the Environment and Society Program at St. Thomas University. And I was interested, Paul, that you ended up by saying the nuclear industry hates it when we use the word plutonium because Janice and I are running a project at St. Thomas called the Plutonium Project. And we recently invited um, the CEO of Moltex Energy to speak to our class, uh, our students actually, our, our um, as, as research assistants, and which he did, which was good for him, but he said, okay, I'll do it, but I hate the name of your project. <laughs> They do not like us talking about plutonium. Um, so the story, the, uh, the, the chapter is the story of small modular nuclear reactors, which are called SMRs, the industry calls them, or SMNRs, uh, not to use the nuclear N, in Canada, and how we got to the stage and where we're at with them. And Ole and Janice and Angela, who's with us, and of course, Bernane and Gordon Edwards, who I see answering questions in the Q&A. And so many more are members of a wonderful community of activists across Canada and internationally. And we're sharing information about nuclear energy and supporting each other as we face the nuclear industry, which in some days it feels like uh, the evil empire. <laughs> I know it's not, but it often feels like what we're up against. Just to give you an example, the last few days have been so hectic. Just a few days ago, National, uh, Natural Resources Canada put a notice on its website indicating that they're gonna release their new radioactive waste policy imminently. That put us on high alert because a number of us have been working for the last few years uh, on this particular policy piece, we've come out with an alternative policy. And what we're waiting to find out is if the new policy will approve plutonium reprocessing of used nuclear fuel, which is high level nuclear waste, which was definitely hinted at in the draft policy that came out last year. So that was a, a few days ago. And then yesterday, in the morning, there was a news release that SNC Lavalin, who's everyone's favorite Canadian company, um, became a minority shareholder in Moltex, which is a UK startup. It's a small company uh, with an office in St. John, New Brunswick, that openly plans to reprocess used fuel. And then, of course, the budget came out yesterday with tax breaks for uh, plutonium new pro uh, reprocessing. And so that was kind of a shock because at the moment, plutonium reprocessing is still uh, not permitted in Canada. So that's an interesting one. And then today, just a few hours ago, there was news that came out on CBC that Ontario Power Generation, which is the um, one of the nuclear utilities in Ontario, of course, will be visiting New Brunswick and our Point Lepro nuclear reactor with a view to becoming part owners of our nuclear plant here. And OPG is actually, they uh, gave a few years ago, a million dollars to the Moltex company because they're interested in the reprocessing technology. So I'm gonna talk about plutonium, but I just wanna state clearly, um, Paul already said this, but, but just to be really clear, that our review of peer reviewed research has convinced us and many other people that there's no way that the planned proposed expa uh, expa expansion of nuclear energy in Canada, which at the moment is these small reactors, although the industry is talking now about more can do reactors, there's no way that they can contribute in any meaningful way to climate action. And we should care about this. Um, they're way too slow. They may not even work. Uh, they're far too expensive. They're going to suck up billions of dollars of public funds if the industry gets its way. And if they can actually get them to work, um, these small reactors will create another legacy of new kinds of nuclear waste that future generations will be having to deal with and paying to maintain forever. I also want to just make it clear that the nuclear industry and the government are using sales and promotional material, whatever you want to call it, propaganda, whatever, to sell the nuclear dream. 
And just to remind everybody that the nuclear industry has played a big part in creating the climate crisis by selling the dream that one day we're gonna have limitless energy, boundless energy, energy that's gonna to be too cheap to meter. And we can all just use as much as we want because nuclear energy will eventually come through. And of course, the nuclear industry has had half a century of peddling that dream in Canada to Canadians and the dream hasn't panned out. And now <laughs> the twisted irony is that after playing this big role, after making these claims, which I would argue has helped to create the climate crisis, the nuclear industry is now selling the idea that nuclear energy will help us end the climate crisis and specifically by building out these small modular reactors. So let's talk about plutonium. Um, the federal budget, as I mentioned, has tax credits and financial incentives for companies engaged in nuclear fuel reprocessing, which is extracting plutonium from used nuclear fuel. And as I mentioned, it's currently, as of today, it's not permitted in Canada. That might change by Friday. So why is this happening now? Um, and I'm hoping that we can get some discussion going around this. Um, all of these activities that I mentioned that are just happening the last few days, but this has been going on for quite a long time. The nuclear industry, which is a collection of companies, at the moment they're mostly American companies, but of course, as I mentioned, we have SNC Lavalin. We have a number of startup companies from the States and some big, more established nuclear companies that have offices in Canada now. And then, of course, we have the big public utilities that are part of the industry. We have NB Power here in New Brunswick. Ontario Power Generation and Bruce Power in Ontario. And currently in Canada, we only have can-do reactors that have an end of life coming up. Some of them have been refurbished and some of them are undergoing refurbish refurbishment now, the reactors. And just very, very recently, just in the last couple of months, um, the industry is talking about building more can-dos, but they haven't been more, they haven't been that successful, the can-do reactors. And so they, they've come up with this idea, the industry, that these small, what they're calling the small modular reactors are their way to save the industry. But the industry globally is, very, is moribund. It's quite desperate actually, because its share of electricity generation is falling. And for reasons that Paul mentioned and are very well known, um, the private sector is extremely reluctant to invest in the nuclear industry um, because um, nuclear plants are so expensive to build. Um, if there's a nuclear accident anywhere in the world, certainly after the last one that happened in the last big one, uh, the triple meltdown in, in Fukushima in 2012, there was a, um, a slowdown uh, in, in interest in the nuclear. And, and so and then, of course, it's very controversial. There's a lot of people, like many on the call, <laughs> names that I recognize, who are um, actively lobbying, pushing, activating, activating against the nuclear industry. And so it's very controversial. And so the public sector does not like to invest in it. And so basically, it, the nuclear industry has to be almost exclusively funded by public dollars. And just as an indication of how desperate the, the nuclear industry is in Canada, right now there's pretty well 12 of these uh, small modular re reactor designs that are all different. They're all actually competing with each other that are under review by our nuclear reg regulator, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. They're very different from the current reactor in re reactors in Canada, the CANDUs. Um, they have different cooling systems, use different kinds of fuel. And really they have no idea uh, if any of them are gonna work. So they're just throwing everything out there, um, trying desperately to make something happen. And they're you know, trying to get basically more public money for the industry. So why are, they, why are they after reprocessing? Well, currently, and I've seen different figures on this, there's either a 60 year or 150 year supply of uranium in the world. And the nuclear industry right from the start has been wanting to use plutonium as fuel for new reactors. And so there are 
basically when the fuel is uh, used from a reactor, as Paul mentioned, every nuclear reactor creates uh, plutonium as a byproduct of the nuclear fission process. And so when the used fuel comes out of the reactor, used meaning it's no longer uh, economically creating a nuclear reaction, um, there's still there's plutonium in it. And currently at the moment, we are storing those, uh, storing that plutonium near the uh, existing Kandu reactors. And there's uh, the companies want to extract the plutonium from the uh, existing Kandu fuel supply and make new fuel for reactors. And, and the idea, which has been around for decades, has been that uh, if, if the nuclear industry can do this, then um, they will have an endless supply of fuel for the nuclear industry forever, basically. And it won't, won't matter if the, the uranium runs out eventually that they'll just run all these reactors off plutonium. So that's the idea. And they've been trying to do this in Canada. They've uh, tried uh, unsuccessfully to do this. And so what we think is happening now is for whatever reason, New Brunswick was picked as the guinea pig for the plutonium experiment. And so we have these two companies, I mentioned Moltex, the other one is called ARC. They've got a reactor called the ARC 100. And interestingly enough, in Canada, they're not advertising the fact that they intend to reprocess the plutonium um, from their reactor once the first fuel load comes through. But uh, in the US, um, they are talking about that. And it's quite clear that's what the plan is. So basically, we, the two reactors that are proposed in New Brunswick which are the Moltex and the ARC reactors, are both planning to reprocess um, plutonium at the Point La Pro site on the Bay of Fundy. And why are they doing this? As Well, as I mentioned, they're hoping to get fuel for their reactors. This is the, uh, the industry's dream. It's very connected to the research that's going on at Chalk River uh, right now in Ontario, in the upper Ottawa Valley. Um, the research, they are building a new advanced, mater advanced nuclear materials research center that is, I think, almost complete. It will be open this week or this year or next year. Uh, they're going to be spending like a billion dollars of tax money on it. And the, the plan is to uh, do um, research on plutonium reprocessing. And so really the reactors in, in New Brunswick, um, one is a molten salt reactor, the other one's a sodium cooled reactor. They're very different from the light water reactors that exist almost everywhere else in the world or the heavy water reactors that we have here in Canada. And really um, all the research suggests that neither of these two reactors for New Brunswick have really a hope in hell of actually ever generating electricity, but that's not the point. The point is that they're all about um, plutonium reprocessing. And so just having these reactors in New Brunswick is the reason that we are having uh, nuclear fuel research going on uh, specifically at Chalk River and they need an excuse to conduct that research. And so um, the reactors in New Brunswick are basically the excuse to conduct the research at Chalk River. Whether these reactors will ever be built in New Brunswick, um, probably not, just because of the designs. However, this is a very dangerous development, as Paul suggested. Um, the, the, our policymakers are just sleepwalking into this. The, the level of ignorance, both at the provincial level and the federal level, to the, the extent that we've been able to have any kind of interaction with policy people, um, is just astonishing. They're not reading the research. The research is really clear, as Paul uh, suggested. Um, and in fact, we had um, a series of uh, non-proliferation, nuclear weapons uh, non-proliferation experts from the US who've written three times to our prime minister uh, with grave concerns about the Moltex project and the signal that it's giving internationally. Right now, if Canada starts reprocessing, we'll be the only country aside from Japan that's not a nuclear weapon state that gets into, that will be doing reprocessing. It sends a very dangerous signal to countries around the world, let alone the potential environmental impacts of doing this here 
in um, in Canada, in New Brunswick. So I'm just going to conclude, uh, just say a few things here about this, that what we need to be doing now is to be, whoops, what we need to be doing now is just to be talking about it and asking questions, lots of questions. Um, we, we're still, as I say, we're still having um, people who don't know what's going on and we need to be sharing this information as much as we can. Um, I don't think Renane mentioned this at the beginning. So I'll just say that we're just in the last part of a four month campaign on banning uh, nuclear fuel reprocessing, um, plutonium reprocessing. I hope uh, many of you have been seeing the different um, outputs that we've had. We, and this, is, this webinar is actually part of it. So we're just coming up to that. Um, we're gonna be ending this at the end of April with a lobby and activities in, in Ottawa um, at the end of April to continue this campaign. And we just hope um, that all of you will be paying attention if in fact in the next few days, um, the government does allow nuclear fuel reprocessing that um, we'll be able to get some mobilization going to protest this. So I think I've used up my time, Brene. And, yes, you uh, have, but well, you've used it well. <laughs> okay, thank you very so, much. Thanks very much, Susan. And we will be, we will be, uh, We'll wrap in the wrap up. We'll mention it, and we will be doing an alert when we do get uh, the radioactive waste policy uh, released by Natural Resources Canada. So thanks very much for that, Susan. So Paul took us low, then high, then low. And Susan just kind of kept us on that low. <laughs> so over to Angela, and Angela, Angela Bishop is a campaigner with the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. And uh, Angela is going to be talking about the BWRX 300, our reactor, which Ontario Power Generation is proposing to construct uh, in the GTA area in uh, municipality of Clarington, just east of Toronto. So Angela, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bernane. And... Thanks to Paul and Susan for your excellent presentations. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about Darlington. So the Darlington Nuclear Generating Station sits on the North Shore of Lake Ontario, to 70 kilometers east of Toronto within the GTA or the Greater Toronto Area. This is home to 6 million people. On this slide, Darlington is the yellow dot under the words region of Durham. This site currently hosts four very large CANDU reactors. In fact, Darlington is already the fourth largest nuclear station in North America. All four reactors are aging and in the process of being rebuilt, extending their lives for another four decades and locking us into very high cost nuclear power for at least that long. OPG, or Ontario Power Generation, owned by the Government of Ontario, has been trying since at least 2007 to build new reactors on this same site. When the 2009 fixed cost bid came in for two new can-do reactors at $26 billion, the Energy Minister got sticker shock, cancelled the project, and moved aggressively to invest in renewables. Undeterred, the nuclear industry persisted, and in August of 2012, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission issued a site preparation license for OPG's Darlington site that included pre-approval for up to four new nuclear reactors of unspecified design. OPG considered many different reactors as candidates for construction at Darlington, in 2021, OPG announced that it had selected an American-Japanese private alliance, GE Hitachi, to develop one to four prototype 300 megawatt boiling water reactors, the BWRX 300. Since Canada only has experience with heavy water can-do reactors, which use a different fuel, have a different operating system and generate different wastes, 
the selection of the BWRX 300 is a significant departure for Canada. Very little is known about this chosen experimental reactor. We know that it will use three to 5% enriched uranium for fuel. Since we don't enrich uranium in Canada, this fuel will have to be imported from the US, unless Canada decides to get into the dirty enrichment game. We know that the reactor will extend 38 meters underground and 35 meters above ground. That's a 10 story building below and another 10 story building above ground. And we know that the, the reactor's fuel assemblies are nine times longer and 10 times heavier than a can-do fuel bundle, meaning waste storage will be very different than can-do waste storage. The BWRX 300 reactor has not been constructed nor operated anywhere in the world. You could say it's a PowerPoint reactor. It has not been licensed or approved by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Despite this, OPG held a groundbreaking ceremony at Darlington last December and is now preparing the site. Disgraced SNC-Lavalin has already signed on as the architect engineer and ACON will build the plant. OPG claims it will be generating electricity by 2029, though this is a long shot. If built ever, this will be the first on-grid SMR in Canada and the Western world. It may also be just the first of four built on the site. Ontario is the global guinea pig. Other utilities are lining up to build the same design after Ontario experiments with it, including Saskatchewan's Sask Power and the Tennessee Valley Authority, as have companies in Poland and Estonia, which at present have no nuclear facilities or regulatory agencies. The cost estimates for the Darlington SMR have yet to be revealed, but the industry produced Canadian SMR roadmap forecasts the cost of electricity to be 16.3 cents per kilowatt hour. But they note that if there's a 3% capital cost overrun, which we would presume would be inevitable, the cost will rise to 21.5 cents per kilowatt hour. This is many times more expensive than green alternatives and will be a burden to Ontario tax and rate payers for decades. Federal taxpayers will also be on the hook. Just last no October, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank announced a $970 million low interest loan to OPG for this project. This is a stupid investment. They could have instead invested that billion in conservation and renewables, lowering electricity costs for Ontario consumers and meeting our greenhouse gas targets much faster without producing long lived wastes. And of course, if there's an accident, all Canadians will have to cover the costs of cleanup, relocations, healthcare, et cetera, since nuclear operators are only responsible to pay up to $1 billion. Let's, and then there's the deadly waste. A BWRX 300 reactor will produce electricity for only 30, maybe 60 years. Yet according to Canada's Nuclear Waste Management Organization, nuclear waste must be contained and isolated from people in the environment for 1 million years. Despite the nuke industry telling us for 70 years that they would solve the waste issue, they still have no solution except the hope of burying and abandoning it on indigenous lands for eternity. This is intergenerational and racial injustice. So there are alternatives. Starting from the left on this chart, saving energy and reducing our demand is the best way to lower, lower energy costs. Proven wind, water, solar, would all cost just one third the price of new nuclear, saving Ontarians billions of dollars. Water power from Quebec alone could easily replace the power promised from this SMR at one third to one quarter the price. Wind power on the Great Lakes also has huge potential to replace nuclear in Ontario. The Ontario Power Authority did a study that showed we could meet 80% of Ontario's electricity demand with offshore wind. 
it's time to end the moratorium on offshore wind power in Ontario. Smart economies, including most European states, are investing aggressively in renewables and conservation. So why is Ontario going down the radioactive rabbit hole? Well, the Ford government has a hate on for renewables. And since Ontario doesn't have a competitive electricity market, decisions are political rather than market driven. Nuclear is state subsidized. No nuclear project in Ontario has ever had to compete in an open procurement. It would never win against lower cost, reliable renewables. The bottom line is that it doesn't make sense to build new G a new GTA reactor, given that we have cleaner, safer, quicker and lower cost options to keep our lights on and reduce our greenhouse gas pollution without requiring future generations to safeguard radioactive wastes for millions of years and without risking present and future generations to catastrophic accidents and radiological releases. So please go to nogtareactor.ca to send a message to Ontario's political leaders telling them to say no to a new SMR in the GTA and yes to renewables and conservation. Make your voices heard. If you do send that letter in, we'll add you to our campaign list and you'll get updates on this campaign as we move forward. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Angela. That was excellent. Um, so I'm going to move to Q&A. And uh, you might see that we've been joined by uh, Gordon Edwards, Dr. Gordon Edwards and Ole Hendrickson, Mike, uh, just so they can give us a little assistance with some of the questions. And there were actually some questions posed for Gordon, uh, even though he wasn't a panelist, but that just says how much we like to ask Gordon questions. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to jump the queue and start with a, a, a history question for Paul, because, you know, as I listen particularly to Susan and uh, Angela, I'm reminded of that runaway utility uh, in the 1980s uh, called Ontario Hydro. And Paul, can you give us just a summary of Ontario Hydro uh, before it became Ontario Power Generation and um, when it sort of went under command and control of a consultant brought in from the US, what were those conditions and how similar or different are they from today? I hope that's a fair question. Well, it gets to the heart of, uh, and Gordon was involved a long time ago, uh, there was a Royal Commission on Ontario which looked uh, at what the energy future would uh, look like in Ontario for a quarter of a century. So in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, Ontario Hydro back then was officially forecasting that the peak demand in Ontario would be around now, 2010, uh, uh, to 2020 would be 130,000 megawatts. That would be the peak demand in Ontario. So they had to build basically nuclear plants in order to meet that demand. Nuclear plants and every large body of water in Ontario, like including Lake Simcoe, Lake Huron, the Ottawa River, Lake Nipigon, and uh, also a whole fleet of coal plants to meet this demand. So 130,000 megawatts was the official uh, uh, target or demand estimate that Ontario Hydro put before this commission for, for the early part of the 21st century. Well, in Ontario now, it's about 23,000 megawatts, the total peak demand. So they're off by more than 100,000 megawatts in their official projection. So when people uh, meet up against the nuclear industry and you're put on the spot for being irrational or speculative or you don't, haven't done your homework or you're just you know naive or whatever. These officials were, were telling the Ontario government and the Royal Commission that this is what, what, what demand was gonna be like uh, in the early part of the 21st century. And therefore they had to go uh, at full barrel into building all these nuclear and coal plants. And on that basis, the Darlington plant, which is the, the latest one that was uh, started in Ontario, 
there was no environmental assessment whatsoever. It was exempted from uh, an environmental assessment because it was an emergency that it get that it got built, and the original cost estimate was three point four billion dollars, and it ended up with the heavy water uh, uh, load in it ended up being fourteen billion dollars. So that was so this uh, runaway train, a nuclear train, uh, ended up bankrupting Ontario Hydro. So uh, under the Harris government, they actually had to, they never called it bankruptcy, but basically um, they moved a whole bunch of nuclear debt off of the uh, uh, electric, electric utility balance sheet and put it on the provincial treasury balance sheet so that it got paid off, that it hasn't been paid off in taxes rather than in electricity rates, which kept our uh, electricity rates artificially low. So that's how we sort of got into this um, uh, mess. And, and now they're coming back with this even more ludicrous uh, plan with the SMRs, because it's, it's like history repeating itself where we've seen this bad movie before, because if you just think about it from an elementary logic point of view, if you're gonna build a 300 megawatt reactor, that's not gonna replace a Darlington. Darlington is about 3,500 megawatts. So you have to build 10, 11, or 12 of these 300 megawatt SMRs to replace a Darlington. Well, each one of those is gonna to have to have a separate uh, um, transmission infrastructure and switchyard, et cetera, et cetera. They're gonna to have to be located. They can't all be located on the Darlington site. So they're gonna be in different areas. They've managed to, uh, finagle it so that anything 300 megawatts or less doesn't have an environmental assessment. So we've seen that uh, trick before. Um, and somehow they're, they're postulating that um, 10 SMRs are gonna be cheaper than one uh, large can do, for instance, right? The argument used to be that you build the nuclear plant bigger and bigger and bigger and you take advantage of economies of scale to uh, to make the cost of electricity cheaper. Well, that never worked out because Ontario Hydro went bankrupt. So now they're reversing the argument and say, well, we're just gonna build these modular reactors, but we have to build 10 of them in order to uh, e equal the power output of a Darlington. So just in basic logic, it doesn't make sense. And on top of that, they're all gonna produce plutonium. So there's pr the proliferation danger and they're all gonna produce nuclear waste and they're gonna produce more nuclear waste than a single Darlington, that's bad enough. If, if they're gonna reprocess some of this stuff, then there's gonna be even a higher volume of really, really dangerous uh, radioactive wastes. Okay, great, great answer. Great, great bit of history to bring us to the present. Um, we've got 10 questions. Oh, now we've got 12, we had 10 a minute ago. So I think we'll actually, I'm sorry to say, we're gonna cut the questions off now. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna ask all the panelists to try to give fairly succinct answers. Uh, the first question is from Simon and it's for Paul. Um, and Simon is asking uh, for return on investment financial information and or documentation for solar panel manufacturing output as per your reference of the six major top manufacturers globally, whom are providing gigawatt hours of renewable electricity. So um, I think maybe, Sia, uh, Paul, if you could just give a sort of a summary in terms of financial yep. information, profitability perhaps around, uh, around the, new, the um, major solar manufacturing uh, sector. Right. Okay, so I don't have the figures in my head or at my fingertips, but uh, for the questioner, you can go to uh, an online journal called um, uh, uh, Photovoltaics, PV, um, P PV Photovoltaics, and there's the information is in there about the top six solar manufacturers, and also uh, the one Canadian solar uh, manufacturing company, major company that's part of this top six, is based in Guelph, Ontario, and they just announced their latest quarterly results. And so you can just Google Canadian solar latest results. And don't quote me on this, but the, their 
increase in profit is off the charts, like it's jaw dropping. And they're building more plants to build more panels because it's obviously profitable. And they're also now in the battery uh, storage uh, uh, game. Great, good, thanks, Paul. Uh, a question I'm gonna direct to Gordon, and I think I'm gonna combine a question, a comment or a question that was in the chat that I don't recall precisely, but the question from Scott is whether plutonium is synonymous with high level nuclear waste. There was also a question, maybe you can add in Susan the detail on it that came in the chat around plutonium being a, uh, a forever fuel. Susan, yeah, you might remember the detail on that. Yeah, and that was actually Janet Graham asked that question. How long can plutonium how long can plutonium give out basically? Or how long I'll just say how long can it last? Because I think I suggested something that Gordon corrected me on. So maybe you could handle both of those, Gordon. Great, thanks. Oh, you're uh, still on your mic. Yeah, there plutonium is only a, a small fraction of the uh, high level radioactive waste. The, uh, if you take a fuel bundle about the size of a fireplace log from a CANDU reactor, um, less than 1%, in fact, less than half of 1% is plutonium. Um, and, uh, um, but that's the stuff that you can make bombs with. There's nothing else in that fuel bundle that you can make bombs with. Um, and, and there's nothing else in that fuel bundle that can also be used to fuel a, a, a newly started up nuclear reactor because the uranium that's present in that spent fuel bundle is no longer sufficiently reactive to to run a reactor of any kind. So uh, it's the plutonium that uh, that uh, either the military or the civilian dreamers of a nuclear utopia are after. Now, uh, the, the high level waste is, is hundreds of materials which are byproducts of uranium that have been broken. The uranium atoms have been broken apart and it's all these broken pieces of uranium atoms. And there's initially about a thousand of them. And gradually after 10 years, there's only about 200 left. And as time goes on, there are less and less, but, but there's also changes going on. So it remains dangerous for literally not just 1 million, but 10 million years and more. So um, uh, that's the high level waste. And that's the stuff that is very, very poisonous and very, very toxic. Plutonium is toxic, but not unapproachable. You can actually smuggle plutonium across a border without too much difficulty once it's separated from the other waste. Uh, now, with regard to the length of time that you can depend upon plutonium as a fuel, every plutonium atom starts off as a uranium atom. So once the uranium is depleted, you can coast for a while on the plutonium, but you can't make it forever because uh, you, you need uranium to get plutonium. Uh, one of the reasons people talk about thorium as another uh, naturally occurring radioactive element that could be used as a surrogate fuel in the future, that would only extend the lifetime of nuclear a little longer because that's also a finite resource. So the idea of infinite Fission re energy is not on the not on the drawing boards by in anybody's dream book, so that's that's really it. Now the problem with plutonium is that if you try and access it for civilian purposes, that is to use as a fuel, then you make it available commercially. And what and it, once things are made available commercially, criminals will always get their hands on a, some of it, and so criminals and terrorists will have access to plutonium once it circulates as a as a commercial commodity. And that means that you can have anybody making it their own atomic bombs. And since plutonium can be smuggled across borders once it's separated, uh, you, you can no longer keep track of it at all. So it's a really nightmare situation. And it has grave, uh, it has grave significance, not only for, uh, for the weapons connection, but also for the, uh, uh, the nature of society as a whole. There's a wonderful report issued by a nuclear scientist and nuclear physicist, Sir Brian Flowers, for the UK government back in 1976. And he pointed out that the whole of society would change if plutonium were being circulated in society because everybody would have, to, you'd have to be living in a, in a paramilitary strait. There would have to be basically, uh, uh, you might say, uh, uh, martial, martial law in order to safeguard the plutonium. And that would also allow the nuclear industry to keep secrets from everybody, including the elected representatives. Even the elected re representatives could not be trusted to know what's going on. That's the short story there. Great, thank you, Gordon. 
And uh, the next question, another question for Simon, and it's directed to Paul, but it, it sort of bridges over some of what Gordon was just talking about in his response about plutonium. Uh, the question is, how did Russian spies get plutonium or nuclear weapon technologies? They did not have this information or technologies before 1950. A question from Simon and to Paul or Gordon. Well, I, I can answer part of that. Um, as we mentioned, the uh, NRX reactor was built in Chalk River starting in 1946. It actually went critical in 1947. And one of the people who designed that NRX reactor was a brilliant um, nuclear physicist, theoretical physicist named Bruno Pontecorvo. Um, and he uh, in, was there until uh, 19, late 1949. And then he went to England to work in uh, the Harwell nuclear uh, uh, research uh, place that was developing nuclear weapons for Britain. And then he defected to the Soviet Union. And it turned out that uh, he, uh, or very likely him, uh, provided the blueprints for the NRX reactor to the Russians because Stalin's um, head of secret, the secret police, Leventry Beria, uh, was put in charge of scouring North America for atomic bomb secrets during World War II. And one of the spies that he had was Klaus Fuchs, um, who actually uh, delivered to the Soviet Union the, the rough bombs design for the hydrogen bomb. Um, and he was the most notorious, but there was several others. There was uh, a British physicist named Alan Nan May, who went to prison in, in England for um, giving the Russian secrets when he was at Chalk River. Um, so that's how the Soviet Union got um, critical information because they were, they were way behind the others, uh, behind the Americans. Um, and so they sought to get information from whomever they could, could get and wherever they could get it. So they built copies of the NRX in the Soviet Union to make plutonium for their atomic bombs. Their first atomic bomb was detonated in 1949, so four years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it was a plutonium bomb. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, Bob. and uh, yes, briefly. Uh, sorry. Briefly. Yes, that that same technology was shared. The the French and the British were working in a secret lab here in Montreal in the 40s before the dropping of the first atomic bombs. They helped to design the NRX reactor. And when the French went back to France, they carried the design of the NRX with them and they helped Israel to, to build their reactor, which produced the plutonium for their bombs using those same designs for the NRX reactor. We also gave an NRX reactor to India years later, which they used to produce plutonium for their first atomic bomb. And we also sold plutonium to the Americans for, uh, for 20 years. Uh, specifically for bomb purposes. And we also gave the first sample of plutonium to the British just about a, just months before they detonated their first atomic bomb using plutonium. So uh, actually Canada, which pretends to be so innocent and so peace loving and so on, nevertheless has played a, a, a very important, small but important role in, in the weapons programs of the US, France, Britain, Russia, Israel, and India. Quite an accomplishment. Pakistan and Pakistan. Uh, well, Pakistan less so, I think, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> Add it to the list. Uh, I'm going to direct the next two questions, both from Simon, and I'm going to direct them both to Susan. And maybe, Susan, I'll, I'll, I'll post both the questions, and maybe you'll have to answer them separately, or maybe you can roll it in together. The first one is uh, Simon's asking for a reference uh, around the public funds uh, you were making reference to public funds that are going to be used directly for nuclear energy in terms of the federal budget issued yesterday. Um, and he's asking if it's possible it was included in shadow funding regime for climate change green energy credit. Mm. Uh, the other part of Simon's the next question, which I think is closely related, is Simon's asking about the Biden, and he says the Biden Inflation Reduction Act had more than $287 billion in climate change actions, including nuclear. Um, how is Canada benefiting from this nuclear plutonium processing? I'm not fully getting this okay. sequence there, but Susan, I'm gonna put all those questions to you. Okay. 
okay, I'll, I'll answer the US one really quickly and maybe someone else has more information on the panel here, but I'll just say that there's much more than there even was like a year ago. There's much more collaboration going on between the US and Canada in a variety of areas, all things nuclear. And also many of the SMRs that are planned here for Canada that are being uh, designed or you know built, they're, they're hoping to build them here in Canada are actually the same things happening in the US. So there's a lot of cross fertilization. So really like, you know, money from the, the US could be working for reactors built here or vice versa. It's gonna get fuzzier and fuzzier. So that may answer the, the Biden, uh, Inflation Reduction Act or whatever it's called question. Um, as far as the budget that came out yesterday, I did post something um, to one of the lists. I'll just really, really briefly go over it. So the big one that I'm, I would say that I'm most concerned is the Canada Infrastructure Bank. They've just been given $20 billion to invest in bills for what they're calling clean energy projects which we know that the you know the governments uh, provincial and federal are term terming uh nuclear energy is clean so that's the one i'm concerned about that is the same bank that loaned uh, 970 million dollars to opg to develop their reactor that um uh, angela was talking about the bwrx uh, 300 and, and then there's also a number of different tax incentives, which are also public funds because they allow uh, government, the companies involved to reduce their taxes. So there's different tax credits, specifically in the case of the tax credits, specifically for uh, re reprocessing technologies. So that's, that was uh, my concern. That's it. Great, thanks, Susan. Uh, a question for, from Faye. Uh, about plans for uh, the production of uh, uh, enriched fuel at either the BWXT fuel facility in Peterborough or Cameco's uh, fuel facility in Port Hope. Um, I'll open that, maybe start with Gordon or Paul. And could I ask Gordon, Gold, I think. Could I just ask Gold as well to talk about the what's happening up in Chalk River with the, the uh, research center there, maybe as part of the question? Sure. So, Gordon, if you can speak to the where you think the enriched fuel will be produced or if it's going to be imported from the U.S. because we currently don't produce it. Well, yeah, it's important to realize that all of the Canadian reactors that we've been using for electricity generation have all used natural uranium, which means uranium that is mined out of the earth and processed into fuel chemically here in Canada. Uh, we don't have any enrichment facilities in Canada. Enrichment is the way of an of increasing the explosive type of uranium, which is uranium-235. And that's a difficult, dangerous, and, and costly technology, which is slow to, to produce weapons-grade material. It'll only produce weapons-grade material gradually. And so you have a certain amount of warning time as to when it's on its way towards weapons-grade. But before it gets to weapons-grade, below the 20% level, they can use it as fuel. And what we're now facing with these small modular reactors is none of them will operate on natural uranium. They all require either enriched uranium or plutonium as fuel. And uh, also they require a higher degree of enrichment, most of them. That's not true of the BWRX at Darlington, which is more traditional, but a lot of the new ones, which are called fast reactors, if you see the word fast, that's almost a code word for plutonium production. And also it's a code word for highly enriched uranium. You're gonna to have to go to a much higher level of enrichment. So this is all very concerning. And uh, that means that our fuel fabrication plants here in Canada will undoubtedly start fabricating fuel using this enriched material, which is far more dangerous for the workers and for the nearby population uh, in terms of radiological hazard. There's also one thing about enriched uranium that people should know is that unlike can-do fuel, which uses natural uranium, in the can-do fuel, if you put it underground or anywhere on the surface, you can't have uh, what's called a criticality accident. That means a spontaneous nuclear chain reaction. But with enriched fuel, you can. And so enriched fuel, all it requires is ordinary water, just ordinary water, not heavy water. And you can have a spontaneous uh, accidental nuclear chain reaction which can be devastating in its consequences. Great, thanks Gordon. Oh, can you talk for a moment about the, 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 the Chalk River connection, the, the new research facility that's uh, got a fuel 
uh, fabrication uh, element to it. Yeah, <clears throat> Paul showed some excellent pictures from the early history of Chalk River, which was, um, it was basically a World War II plutonium production military facility until 1952 when Atomic Energy of Canada Limited was started by C.D. Howe. Uh, and um, he had, a, it then sort of had a dual mission of also looking at civilian reactors as well as plutonium production. So fast forward to um, today when we have old facilities that can do um, plutonium fuel fabrication, hot cells can handle these uh, irradiated um, uh, fuel rods, uh, um, but they are antiquated and the um, operators, the um, companies that are contracted to operate Chalk River are now wanting to build a, a brand new um, facility with some highly shielded hot cells and some lesser shielded hot cells to, to do, uh, well, plutonium and enriched fuel research, basically, for, for SMRs. It's called the Advanced Nuclear Materials Research Center. There was a groundbreaking ceremony in December, almost the same time as the one for the BWRX, and, um, but it's going to take a long time. I think to uh, actually, it's a very complex project to, to try to build this and the money isn't fully appropriated. It would come from uh, taxpayers. So we need to keep an eye on, on uh, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited and Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, their contractor, their private con own contractor that's uh, trying to build this facility with tax dollars. Great, thanks very much all. Um, next question is from Nancy and it's a question to Paul. She's wondering about uh, information source for the amount of plutonium sent to the US hidden from the public for 20 years post World War II. Might be a very specific um, reference we can follow up. Yeah, I don't have it off the top of my head, uh, but it's there's no doubt that that's the amount. Um, it was actually reported by the U.S. Department of Energy, which ran the Savannah River plant, the uh, reprocessing plant that I showed earlier in my presentation. So they're they're quite open about it now because it's past history as far as they're concerned. Um, they're more uh, focused now on the contamination at the site, not just from the Chalk River plutonium, but from other, you know, many other sources during the height of the uh, uh, hydrogen bomb program that they had there <clears throat> but I, I can send I can send a citation to you uh, at Northwatch Bernane and then the person who asked the question can uh, ask you for it yes. sure okay or maybe we could add the reference you've offered to post your slides and notes uh, so maybe we could just check that yeah. there's that the reference yeah. is included in that so everyone would have yeah. access okay that's great yeah. I'll do that Good. We have Thank a we have a letter on the CCNR website from the U.S. Department of Energy acknowledging specifically the 250 kilograms of plutonium that was sold to the Americans for military purposes, and I can send that reference easily to to you. Great, sounds great. Um, a question from Janice that I'm going to direct to Angela. Um, Janice talks of the huge concern about many people not being able to afford food and housing. And Janice is asking if there's any way to focus on and broadcast to the public the large amounts of taxpayers' dollars that are going to the nuclear sector. Uh, Angela. Janice, any ideas you have to share with us? Like we've been focusing on the economics of, you know, the high costs associated with nuclear since we started campaigning on this, which is you know very directly 2008 and prior as well, but I was hired in 2008, and we've, you know, our lead is our chair is Jack Gibbons, who is uh, an economist, and he puts everything into dollar figures. And you would think, especially with conservative government, we would make gains, but I don't know. We're, all we can do is keep pushing on social media, keep you know putting the word out and analyzing the high costs. If you have more ideas, please share them with me. But yeah, that's been our strategy all along and we're still grappling with that. Great, thanks Angela. And Gordon wants to add to this yeah. and then uh, we'll go to our last question, which is to Paul. I, I just wanna say that part of the problem here is that with regard to nuclear policy and energy policy, the Canadian government is totally unequipped to uh, deal in a rational way with this. 
We don't have agencies that can do independent scrutiny. And the result is that the politicians are being suckered in by basically uh, um, uh, PR uh, talk which is going to cost billions and billions of dollars more than it would if they invested in alternate strategies. But these people in the nuclear industry have been around for decades and they've infiltrated into the public service and they have the ear of the politicians at a very close level. That We, we had an assistant deputy minister of Enercan who was a whole day had meetings with nuclear industry people. And he said at the end of that day, he realized what the government had to do to, to, to support the industry. So they, they, we're not dealing here with democracy. We're not dealing with even rational business practices. We're dealing with a naive governments uh, who don't really understand what they're getting into. And if they looked at the history of the nuclear industry, recently we had uh, uh, two nuclear giant companies that went bankrupt because of cost overruns on nuclear power plants. And our governments don't seem to be aware of what's going on right under their nose with regard to these cost overruns. Great, thanks Gordon. And our final question for the evening is appropriately to Paul. Uh, and uh, and it's, a, it's a nice note to end on. The nuclear industry says that wind and solar have too large a geographical footprint and people are being convinced of that. So Paul, what are some compelling arguments uh, to debunk that? Your book in a sentence. Uh <laughs> Well, uh, in the slides, I showed some trifecta sites. So that largely solves the problem. In, in many parts in the world, most deserts, most uh, oceanic uh, coastlines, et cetera, are prime candidates for both wind and solar uh, because there's always winds along the coast. And in a place like India, when you think of all of their coastline or Brazil, for instance, um, or the Philippines, a place, Australia, uh, places like that, um, they're, they're prime candidates for both wind and solar projects and uh, battery storage or hydrogen projects. So that actually reduces the land footprint because you have three projects on one site, one large uh, substation for uh, putting the power into the grid, et cetera. They're actually in, in Australia now they're building in large parts of Northwest uh, Australia, they're building these trifecta plants and they're gonna generate hydrogen uh, from completely green sources and pipe it to the coast so that it can be uh, uh, loaded into the, uh, into the uh, tanks, uh, fuel tanks of uh, huge ocean freighters and get rid of the bunker C uh, uh, oil that's being burned very inefficiently in those engines. Um, so that's it. If you're going to think about the nuclear industry versus renewables, you have to, for the nuclear industry, you have to think what's the, what's the land print of uranium mining uh, as well, because that's part and parcel of the nu nuclear fuel cycle. Um, so yes, uh, the reactors themselves have a relatively low uh, land footprint, um, but you have to think about um, the uranium part of that as well. But you also have to think, are you going to pay a bit of a penalty in terms of uh, uh, a land footprint or um, versus um, safety and versus the the specter of plutonium being doubled uh, as some uh, nuclear advocates are are suggesting should happen could, should happen globally? Great, thanks very much, Paul. Gordon, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, uh, the thing about wind and solar is they're here, they're cheap, they're getting cheaper every all every year, whereas nuclear is getting more expensive every year. And uh, um, it's not necessarily permanent. You can take down a wind farm as easy as you can put it up and you don't have a radioactive waste problem like the nuclear reactors. You can't take them down once you put them up. They become a, a radioactive uh, debris. You can't even recycle the materials in them. So... Um, I, I look forward in the future to uh, developing real uh, cost-effective geothermal energy. Geothermal energy, the, the energy from the core of the earth uh, is already heating cities in Iceland and other parts of the world. And once we can tap into geothermal energy, it's 24 seven, it's not interruptible, it's not intermittent. And uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, renewables that we're putting up today are just the first uh, of their kind. Uh, they will not necessarily be permanent. They can be replaced later on with other things which might be better and cheaper and smoother and use less land surface. 
But also, uh, Paul has already demonstrated in his slides uh, how you can use irrigation canals, you can use ponds, you can use uh, offshore wind. Lake Michigan, they've got more, they've got as much wind power in Lake Michigan to produce more than three times the energy requirements of the whole United States. So there are, uh, there are answers to the, uh, to the space problem. Not to say it's easy. It's definitely not easy. None of these things are easy. This is a difficult problem. It's an unsolved problem of the human race. But the way we can make the fastest, most effective and surest approach to, to reducing our carbon emissions is through deploying the things that are cheaper and faster and more uh, assured. And those are the renewables. Great. Thanks very much, Gordon. Thank you so much, Paul, first for writing the book, then for updating it, adding the additional chapters. And thank you for your excellent presentation. And thanks so much to Susan and Angela for their presentations, to Gordon and Noel for, uh, for joining us for the, the Q&A session. I just want to give a brief reminder. Susan mentioned that we have been uh, running a campaign for the last few months focused on getting a ban on reprocessing in Canada. Uh, and if you haven't done so yet, if you could go to reprocessing.ca, close to the top of the page, you'll see a place to link, click on an action alert, and you can use that to send a message to the prime minister and other cabinet members uh, saying uh, we want a ban on reprocessing immediately. Um, we are expecting uh, literally any day uh, the government final response, final uh, policy, that is the output of the two and a half years of our work uh, to, uh, to, to drive a radioactive waste policy, which is accountable and responsible. We're not sure we're gonna get that, uh, but we are sure we're gonna reply. We're certainly going to reply. So. We will, if you're not on the Nuclear Waste Watch uh, email list now, I will add those who were on the webinar this evening and you will get an update. Uh, shortly after the policy is posted, we'll get word out that it's, that it's been posted and then we're going to do a fairly rapid turnaround analysis uh, of that. And so we'll be asking you to join us in responding to that policy uh, when it is available. So. Thank you all very much to our panelists, to our attendees, um, and uh, we'll uh, see you next time. Thanks very much. Reprocessing.ca, that's the website. Thank you all. Bye. Have a nice Bye. evening. Thank Bye. you, Paul. Good, good to Bye. see everyone. Bye, Paul. Thanks Thank all. you.